Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the eighth presentation this semester in the Punjab and the World History, Politics, and Migration series. Uh, for those of you who are new to the program, this uh, series explores the modern history of the Punjab as well as Punjabi migrations in global and transnational contexts. Uh, for those who are new uh, to this uh, series, we have featured scholars from a range of disciplines, from history to religious studies, uh, to cultural studies, people who work on the Sikh empire and its historic importance, uh, the history of colonial Punjab, the history of uh, military recruitment, and later in the term we will explore issues like the contemporary farmers protests and popular and visual culture. Uh, before we begin the program today, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples, whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nilesh Bose, and I'm the convener of the series, the host of the program. I teach South Asian and global history here at the University of Victoria, where I am sitting uh, right with my students uh, here in British Columbia in Canada. So in keeping with recent traditions, uh, our speakers today, we are blessed with two speakers, We'll speak for the first part of the program for a period of approximately 40 to 45 minutes total, followed by an open Q&A moderated by me. And we will end at about 5 to 5, 10 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, when we open for the Q&A, I will ask everybody with questions to please use the digital hand raise function, and I will call on everybody in order. Just so everybody knows, this program is being recorded so I will ask uh, those uh, in the audience out there to ensure that their audio is turned off during the presentations. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Professor Sathwinder Baines uh, from the University of Fraser Valley and Ms. Marianne Balianathos. Professor Baines is Associate Professor in the School of Culture, Media and Society at the University of the Fraser Valley. And her research interests include migration, settlement, integration, uh, and various aspects of South Asian Canadian diaspora studies. Her published work is found in a whole variety of uh, venues, including a work that uh, students and I read for this week, uh, Unmooring the Komagata Maru, Charting Colonial Trajectories, a work that Professor Baines has edited as well as contributed to. And Professor Baines is joined by Marianne Balinathos, who is a PhD candidate in law here at the University of Victoria, and she is writing a dissertation about law and racialization and focuses on past restrictions against Asian migration and settlement in Canada, Canada's Pacific Northwest. Uh, we will start with Marianne and then turn to Sathwinder and then to the Q&A at approximately 4.40 to 4.45 p.m. Pacific time. And we will endeavor to close the session at approximately 5 to 5.10 Pacific time. And at this point, we will now turn uh, it over to Marianne. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this exciting speaker series. And I'm looking forward to the conversation afterwards and to learning along with uh, everyone that's here today. Um, so as part of my research on Canada's head tax, um, Canada's head tax against um, Chinese migrants. I've been looking at the habeas corpus cases of Chinese women, and I've been interested in um, the intersections of gendered racialization and law. And also I've been trying to get a better sense of the legal history in this area. So through this work, um, I learned about the high profile habeas corpus cases of two South Asian women, Harnam Kaur and Qatar Kaur. And um, tonight, my aim is to begin to sketch out some of the connections between the legal treatment of Chinese women and South Asian women in the early 20th century, and to flag some of the overlapping questions concerning Asian women, state law, and race. And I very much welcome any feedback that you might have for me after my presentation. So I'll begin tonight by discussing the head tax and, one, um, and the case of one Chinese woman. Um, and I'll describe the impact that her case had on lawmakers and how we might understand subsequent amendments to the head tax. Next, I will think about how the change to that law 
concerning the immigration of Chinese women caught the attention of the um, South a caught the attention of South Asian men in Vancouver. And I'll end by suggesting how we might consider these two stories together. So as some of you probably are familiar with the head tax, um, as you know, it was a Canadian statute that restricted the immigration of Chinese people to Canada, and it was enforced for nearly 40 years, from 1885 to 1923. It was administered under various iterations of the Chinese Immigration Act, and by 1903, it was a $500 charge that Chinese migrants would pay when they arrived in Canada. So most people didn't have this kind of money, um, and so they would borrow money from different brokers and middlemen, and they would enter into various long-term labor contracts to pay back their debts. And it's uncontroversial to say that um, the head tax contributed to the racialization of Chinese residents as outsiders. This law was about race first and nationality second. So even if you were born in Canada, you were presumptively subject to the head tax. The law was also objectifying. In the 1880s, white elites said that it was a tariff on human flesh that treated Chinese people um, as if they were tea or bars of iron. Now, this um, restrictionist exclusionary law also had exemptions under which eligible Chinese immigrants could come to Canada without paying the head tax. And from the law's very inception, it included exemption categories. So as you can see on my slide, um, these exemptions created different legal statuses for people who are otherwise racialized similarly. And it's clear from the legislative debates, immigration records, and Department of Justice opinions that these categories were carefully crafted. And over the years, the categories expanded, um, but the existing categories could also contract as their definitions were narrowed or refined. And today, what I'm going to focus on is just this first exception, uh, first, the first amendment to the head tax, which was an ex exception for the wives of non-Chinese men. Oops. So on November 5th, 1885, Vivian Yi landed at the port of entry in Victoria. 1885 was the same year that the head tax came into force and the immigration officer charged her the racist landing fee. But there was some confusion about whether this Christian woman from Beijing was properly subject to the charge. The census would later describe her as yellow in color Chinese in race and English in nationality. Viviane was English through marriage. She was married to Charles Moore, an English national from Manchester who had been a British colonial administrator in China. So Viviane's husband believed that she would not have had to pay the head tax if she had been a man. And he was probably right. Educated Chinese men were not required to pay the landing fee. And but for her gender, her Western education probably would have won her an exemption from the tax. So her arrival with a British husband and mixed race children got the attention of the prime minister and drew the careful consideration of parliamentarians, federal government lawyers and the public. All debated what law should apply to mixed marriages and what was the purpose of the head tax? Should it even apply to this class of immigrant? So to answer these questions, white elites confronted an existential problem, which was how to reconcile this racially discriminatory law to the esteemed traditions of British justice and fair play. Eventually, following an abandoned lawsuit and after a failed effort by a group of white senators to repeal the head tax, the Chinese Immigration Act was amended for the first time in 1887 so that it would not apply to Bibian Yi or to the wives of other non-Chinese men. So we see then that racial categories were informed by the traditional, the legal traditions pertaining to marriage and coverture, 
Coverture was a legal principle which had historically incapacitated married women. The Daily Times explained that a woman by marriage loses her identity by merging it with that of her husband. And so even though Bibiane would remain racially Chinese under the census, she was exempted from the head tax on the basis of her marriage to a British subject who was an English national. Um, more broadly, the legislative debate about this First Amendment is also instructive about the nature of exemptions from racial laws. So a majority of senators believe that lifting the head tax from respectable Chinese women could soften the harshness of the head tax, which they criticized for a variety of reasons. One lawmaker, Senator Haythorn, said that the head tax was missing the precious principle of mercy. So mercy is a very layered concept. Um, and Barrington Walker, for example, in his writing on black defendants in Ontario, explained that mercy was tied to beliefs about the superiority of British justice. So in this regard, um, this quote from Senator John Abbott during the head tax debate is illuminating. He said, we all remember the old boast of Britain that the shackles fell from the hands of the slave the moment he landed on British soil. How will it be now to say that there is a dividing line between Canada and the United States? Of what does it consist? The dividing line is that in the United States, a Mongolian is not a free man. And here, Mongolian means Asian. So one interpretation is that Abbott situated the softening of the head tax as an inevitable part of history's progressive arc. The formal abolition of the enslavement of black peoples in the empire epitomized the right-mindedness of British justice. And additionally, Abbott seemed to be constructing cultural heritage in the sense that white elites spoke of collective obligations rooted in both the sins of the past and pride of legal tradition. So mercy in this context in the form of exemptions was a way to uh, reconcile racial violence uh, of the head tax with uh, British justice. So exemptions were a legal tool that could preserve institutional legitimacy while also leaving a discriminatory law intact. My research suggests that Bibiani would also open the door to future exemptions. And so an organization of Chinese merchants lobbied the federal government and eventually in, the, in 1900 obtained another exemption for the wives of Chinese merchants. And so the immigration of Ch married Chinese women to Canada would have interested other Asian communities. And in particular, South Asian leaders petitioned multiple governments for a relaxation of the continuous journey regulation for married women from India. So in three petitions, two in 1911 and one in 1913, the South Asian male community in Vancouver opposed the injustice of discriminatory laws and they incorporated comparative references to other communities. In their October 1911 petition to the Secretary of State for India, they wrote that the citizens of British India were subject to the worst indignities and disabilities under the law, even greater than that which the Chinese and Japanese were experiencing, and that the discriminations were even applied against our cultured and educated men. A second petition sent to Canada's Governor General in May specifically addressed the exclusion of South Asian wives and requested that at least the same consideration and privileges be accorded to them as are already granted to the Japanese. And like the Chinese in British Columbia, they asked that merchants, professional men, and students of the Hindu race may be given free access to the country. So, I don't raise these comparisons to suggest that the experiences of Chinese and Japanese women under the law was an easy one. Um, and there are important ways that seemingly inclusive laws fed into the racialization and discrimination of Asian women. Um, and similarly, the references to class, class status, um, when it came to Chinese immigrants was a contentious issue. And by 1910, the government was actively trying to limit the number of Chinese men who weren't true merchants in their eyes. But this move to comparison is interesting and it's an important one. As we know, conceptions of race are relational. And it's also relevant uh, as we consider the different ways that 
different Asian communities in British Columbia had distinct but overlapping legal histories. Around the same time uh, as these petitions, um, South Asian men led by Hussein Rahim and Balwant Singh were organizing a test case and arranging for the arrival of several women from India. So based on the records I've reviewed, I'm not exactly sure when their efforts started, but at least since October of 1909, the federal government had been monitoring Balwant Singh's efforts to establish a precedent of sponsoring the families of Sikh men to Canada. So the court case I'll be discussing today arose out of the men's second trip with their families. And Hugh Johnson's book, The Voyage of the Komagata Maru, describes their first unsuccessful effort. Um, so on January 21st, 1912, Qatar Corps and Harnam Corps, the wives of Balwant Singh and Bog Singh, and their young children arrived at the port of, Victoria, port of Vancouver via Hong Kong, not direct from India, which was impossible, of course. Um, so the cases of these two women became a test case that many had endeavored to bring about. The cases would become highly publicized, drawing national and international attention. And this has been thoughtfully explored by, by Anak Shidua. So according to the statutory declaration of Qatar Corps, she was 25 when she came to Vancouver. She had married Balwant when she was 18. They had two girls, one four and a half and the other one year old. And according to Harnam's statutory declaration, she was 26. She had married Bog Singh in November of 1910. Um, and her declaration set out that she had left Calcutta with Bog Singh seven months earlier and they had traveled to Hong Kong where they had stayed for three or four months while the men tried to buy steamship tickets to come to Vancouver. So immigration agent James McGill ordered the deportation of the women and their children under the continuous journey regulation. Because Bog and Balwant had previously lived in Canada, they possessed residency status, which was called domicile. So they were allowed entry, but their families were not. The women immediately appealed the deportation order to the minister and McGill informed his superior that a committee of Sikh men had come to see him to ensure that Harnam Kaur was allowed to leave the SS Monteagle because her child was only seven weeks old. Both women along with the children were released on bond, paid by their husbands and other men described by McGill as well-to-do. On April 22nd, the minister upheld the deportation orders. And the SS Montego was scheduled to sail from Vancouver to Hong Kong in a little uh, over a week. So this schedule is apparently well known to the interested parties and the women's lawyers, McCrossan and Harper filed writs of habeas corpus on April 30th as a way to challenge the basis for the deportation orders. Um, so the Moncton Herald reported on the legal arguments that um, the lawyers made. So two of Harper's arguments followed uh, along the lines of the petitions that I mentioned earlier. So he made class-based and gendered arguments. Harper argued that the women were not the intended target of the continuous journey regulation, since the law was aimed at the exclusion of the laboring classes, not of the commercial classes of South Asians. Um, Harper further contended that because both men possessed Canadian domicile, and were British subjects, um, their wives had also acquired this through marriage, through the principle of marital unity. So was there merit to this line of argument that the law should be relaxed for married South Asian women? Well, I haven't yet tracked down the full court records, um, but I can tell you how this same argument was dealt with by the courts when Chinese husbands had made it. So in a later BC Court of Appeal case, a Chinese woman, Wang Shi, who was married to a Chinese merchant, Su Gar, faced deportation because her father was a laborer. Judge McPhillips ruled that although the wife's domicile is the domicile of the husband's in ordinary cases, so i.e. Uh, not cases involving racialized people, um, in this case, the statute stands in the way. So Chinese wives would not acquire Canadian domicile through marriage. The implication here was that because Asian immigrants were subject to particular statutory frameworks, parliament had abridged the common law to the detriment of Asian couples. 
So as for Qatar Corps and Harnam Corps, the court ruled that the deportation orders would stand and dismissed their habeas writs. However, just three weeks after the ruling, the Minister of Immigration allowed them to stay in Canada as an act of grace. The Governor General and Viceroy of India, on learning that the two women were treated as a special case, communicated his pleasure with this outcome to Canada's Deputy Governor General. The Department of Immigration characterized Canada's largesse as an act of grace. In these immigration files, what I found were department memos and letters going out to steamship companies with this phrase, acts of grace, underlined, repeated, and copied over from one document into the next. So what are the implications of this decision? Nayan Shah suggested that state officers granted the requests of racialized Indian migrant families on humanitarian grounds, for the purpose of upholding existing policies and laws without revision. So like Shaw, I see the exceptional treatment of these families as having a significant legal implication, though I want to linger for a time longer on what that might be. About discretion, I wouldn't attribute the final outcome of these cases to the individual Canadian men who felt that there was a compassionate basis for an exception. Where statutes provide for discretionary powers um, and decision-making by government actors, we can ask what conceptions and understandings of law filled that, fill that veiled space. This was also not the first time grace was used. Um, a little less than a year earlier, in the summer of 1911, Mrs. Hira Singh arrived in Vancouver with her daughter, and in spite of breaching the continuous journey regulation, she was exempted as an act of grace. Um, and I think there's also a broader context here to consider. So we might ask whose grace is being exercised or channeled? And I would suggest that it's the grace of the sovereign or the crown. So what is sovereign grace? Well, at least since the 17th century, courts described it as an ancient capacity to right wrongs outside the normal course of law. And by the 20th century, courts likened grace to a royal prerogative uh, in that it was said to derive from a similar source flowing from the sovereign as the fountain and head of justice. So the Crown's prerogatives include the power to declare war, to create Indigenous reserves, and to grant pardons, to show mercy. And there's a kinship between mercy and grace, which is that each allows the Crown to speak from both sides of its mouth. The minister in Ottawa and the administrators in British Columbia use the exercise of grace to deviate from the norm of Asian exclusion but at the same time, they affirmed that very same norm. For Harnam and Qatar, Qatar, it must be observed that any entitlement that they had to stay in Canada, so their entitlement to stay in Canada was not premised on their status as British subjects or on statutory entitlements, but on another's grace. And I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Marianne. There's so much to discuss there, especially the uh, ending that you mentioned about deviating but affirming uh, a norm, which I think is uh, very interesting and very important. Uh, I will now turn it to uh, Sathwinder. Thank you, Nilesh. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Marianne, for starting out. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the territory of the Stolo people, the people of the river, the Halkabilim speaking people, and uh, also my position as a settler uh, to this community. And uh, my kind of growing understanding of my position and my privilege, as well as working towards uh, solidarity and uh, reconciliation and the truth as it unfolds. So I'm really going to talk about uh, labor movements. I think Marianne's touched on a few things uh, in terms of what uh, precedes people coming uh, when they arrived in Canada and their migration stories. So I'm really, really going to talk about uh, the intense factors that really initiated and maintained migration numbers uh, of a mostly bachelor society at the time. And I want to talk about activism 
So I hope your questions uh, will focus on, you know, where are we at in terms of activism from those times till now and what, what has changed, what is still the same. Uh, there were, you know, three main reasons uh, behind increasing South Asian migration to Canada uh, between 1900 and 1910. And at the time, it was mostly Punjabis from Northwest uh, Canada, uh, Northwest India, who were living in the colonies, who migrated from Shanghai and Hong Kong and Singapore and the Malay states. Some came directly from India, but there was a lot who were already traveling in the colonies under British colonial rule. And so they wanted to find work and a better life in Canada. They certainly were escaping persecution as second class citizens from the British Raj. And they helped to build, uh, they wanted to help build support for anti colonial networks across. Uh, Canada from uh, against India. And this was in the early stages, not didn't happen just when Ghadar happened in 1913. So I'll focus on the history of migration of workers as they came to Canada. Uh, as you might know, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, the term that was widely used was Hindu, H-I-N-D-O-O, -O, uh, which was a, a colonial term that was used for the larger majority of people in India. And there wasn't a real understanding uh, by the colonists at the time about Sikhs or people from Punjab. Um, so racism was rampant. It was a white colonial society at the time. And union unions were already established in BC and their attitudes were not very different from the local public. Uh, early union laborers, uh, lab labor leaders encouraged federal and provincial governments to invoke discriminatory laws and regulations that would limit South Asians' migration and ability to work in safe and well-paid jobs. However, there are three historic events that change things, and they're seen as watershed moments uh, uh, that uh, new alliances were formed between labor and South Asian workers. One was World War II, uh, the second was the new wave, the large wave of South Asian migration in the 60s and 70s, in the, especially after multiculturalism, and the organization of farm workers into a union in the 1980s. So the journey has not been easy uh, through the 100 plus years of there's been a lot of courage and struggle and determination, but there has been a loyalty by the South Asian Canadian community towards uh, the labor movement in BC. So well before the migration began to increase in the first decade of the 20th century, early BC unions were opposed to non-white migration and only accepted white members. Their objections were obviously rooted in racism, but also in experience. Uh, you know, they, they routinely talk about cheap oriental labor, but you know, who was who was initiating that cheap oriental labor? That needs to be questioned. And they were seen, uh, Chinese laborers were seen as strike makers and they provided unfair competition. So, you know, again, the, the kind of exploitation of workers, but uh, changing the narrative to make them to be the problem rather than you know, the employer imposing those issues on them. Uh, so there was people like uh, BC's premier and lieutenant governor, uh, Baron James, uh, the coal baron James Dunsmere. He exploited a lot of immigrants at the time. And in his political role, he refused to ban the use of oriental labor in BC because he routinely, routinely himself benefited from it as an employer. And the labor movement, such as the Working Man's Protective Association formed in 1878 in Victoria, was established for the mutual protection of working class in BC against the great influx of Chinese workers. And they wanted to use all legitimate means to suppress their migration. In fact, uh, uh, you know, one of the things they said was, uh, and this is where we really need to have a critical lens that uh, on, on what was said at the time and how history was written and who wrote that history, uh, that without families, because uh, this was all bachelor societies, as uh, uh, Marianne has so well placed women and their role in terms of migration, uh, bachelor societies, uh, there was this idea that because they, could afford to live on only a few cents a day. And uh, these Chinese laborers were making it impossible for the white man to compete. So again, the narrative is flipped to, uh, you know, what that the, the dire conditions that Chinese laborers were facing at the time. So it wasn't until, um, you know, 19, uh, 1907 that uh, the vote was taken away. Uh, by this time, by 1907, South Asians had migrated to Canada. And you may have uh, heard the, the story of the vote, but when the vote was taken away, uh, first from the pro by the province and then by the federal government, it would take 40 years to get that vote back. Uh, 
And at no time in those 40 years did South Asians just rest and wait for the vote to be given to them. They petitioned, they traveled to London and to Ottawa, they advocated, they did uh, petitions from community, uh, did advocacy and raised awareness. And you know, as Marianne has mentioned, the, the head tax of $200 on Asian immigrants upon arrival to Canada in 1908 uh, prohibited a lot of them from entering and it was a racial act. Uh, so uh, the effect of these exclusionary policies, you know, created a, a, just a bachelor society that could not, that were also living in kind of fear of deportation. And all these regulations that Marianne has spoken to also affected their ability to, to go transnationally between home and uh, Canada. So a number of them, when they left, couldn't come back because they didn't have the right papers. And you may have heard that uh, the labor organized uh, into the anti-Asian anti -Asian league that uh, in 1907, where thousands of white citizens uh, rioted through Vancouver's Chinatown, destroying businesses, and then moved to the Japanese town on Powell Street. And um, they, they created uh, also these um, petitions uh, to the mayor uh, to say, don't let anybody else into this community. At the first meeting uh, of the, yeah, let me get the name right, of the Association uh, Asiatic League, Asiatic Exclusion League, uh, they decided to hold a rally uh, in the streets in Vancouver, and they invited trade unionists all the way across from BC and Washington state. The corridor, the I-5 corridor was quite porous at the time. And uh, South Asians as well as white uh, settlers were moving back and forth between California, Oregon and Washington. And you may have heard about that as well. There was a number of South Asians living in Bellingham at the time, working in uh, the mills. And uh, two days before the Vancouver parade was to take place. And the Washington people knew about that parade. Uh, gangs of white tugs in Bellingham uh, rounded up all the Indians in the, in the sawmills and uh, beat them up and ordered them out of town. The Vancouver Daily World claimed the traumatized refugees who were seeking asylum, were now seeking asylum in Canada, uh, though their welcome was likely just as unfriendly as it was uh, in the US. Uh, so it, it, and I quote, somewhere between Bellingham and the British Columbia line, there are 150 natives of India beaten, hungry, naked, or half closed, making their way along the Great Northern Railway, bound for Canadian territory and the protection of the British flag. But as soon as they arrived, local organizers forged ahead with the parade carrying signs and flags calling for a white Canada. While a huge crowd listened to the speeches, thousands split off into uh, violent mobs and they rioted, uh, smashed windows, looted the businesses and beat up the Chinese and Japanese communities. And I want to say here that this history is not taught in the schools and uh, we're not learning about this dark time uh, in British Columbia history. Uh, at, when the South Asians arrived, there was a, a rapid expansion of the forest industry. So a number of them uh, who uh, needed jobs at the time, that seemed to be the first place that they could find work. But the sawmills and other forest related industries were, uh, you know, uh, controlling the wage of South Asian laborers and gave them less than uh, the white settlers. So in the early years, uh, lives were lost. And by that, I mean, not that they were that they died, but that they lives were lost in terms of productivity and production production, because they had to go back and number of them couldn't actually enter back into Canada. Migration dreams were unfilled, unfulfilled. People who uh, were British subjects were not allowed to uh, come to Canada and persecution was meted out. A number uh, my uncle telling me that when he arrived from India in uh, 1908, Eight, uh, he was um, he got off the ship in uh, in in Victoria, and uh, no one had come to pick him up. A lot of people were you know others who had been here before them, so they threw him in jail, and he languished there for a week until he could somehow find a way for to get someone to get him out of there. Uh, there were constant threats of deportation, and yet they persevered. So, like I said, uh, uh, the first people that came, they came through Vancouver and Victoria, and they created societies. The first society was the uh, Khalsa Diwan Society that built the Second Avenue Gurdwara. And at the same, the, these, these temples are places of uh, advocacy, for activism, of uh, revolutionary thought, 
of, of course, of support and solace. And as Marianne has mentioned, the fight in the courts all the time, raising money to support others who were fighting in the courts. And at the time, it seemed like the courts were the only place they could get some sort of resolution. Uh, I'd like to show you a photo if I can um, share screen. I'm going to quickly show you a photo of uh, Ocean Falls. I should have made a PowerPoint. <laughs> mm. No, I'm not able to. Oh, goodness me. No, okay, we'll leave it. Um, so there was uh, temples being built across uh, Vancouver, Abbotsford, New Westminster, Golden, Paldi, Coombs, Ocean Falls. And these places became uh, strongholds uh, for the community. And at the same time, these temples are also being built on that I-5 corridor. So the oldest Sikh temple in BC now stands in Abbotsford, and the second oldest is in Stockton, California. Uh, the third one is in Paldi. The fourth one is in uh, Victoria. So these, uh, these sites of memory contain within them uh, huge histories of uh, both migration and activism. Uh, I, I know that uh, people when they lived here together in closed quarters in bunkhouses, uh, most all men uh, would take on the roles that maybe women and mothers and other family members had taken on in, in their home country and found ways to give support to each other. Uh, the migration to Canada is a chain migration. Somebody came, they called someone, that person called someone. So the chain migration continues today. One of the most often most asked questions in South Asian Canadian communities and Punjabi communities especially is where are you from? Uh, between yourselves, not from other the other, but between ourselves, where are you from? And it's that kinship, that sense of belonging that still is instilled in us that we continue to hold dear. And at that early years, that, that actually held the community in good stead and really provided the support. So we have stories of uh, men who say 50 men living in a, a bunkhouse. And by bunkhouse, I really mean a big room with just bunk after bunk after bunk. And that's why they were called bunkhouses. And the middle of the bunkhouse used to be the stove and the kitchen. And they would assign one of the men to uh, probably a better chef than the rest of them uh, to make the food. And each one would give a penny from their pay uh, towards that man's wage so that he could also save money and send money back home. And if a man got sick or couldn't work or got hurt at the mill, uh, they would do the same thing. They would all put a penny towards his wage, lost wage. And so those kind of stories have really uh, shown us that uh, the, the communities were built on much more than white settler communities could take away from them. Uh, that was some of that resilience and perseverance that we talk about today. And I, I'm really careful to use the word resilience and because you know we keep using that word quite uh, frankly and freely. And I really want to put uh, uh, some take some attention to that word because uh, the resilience came at great cost. Uh, as Marianne has said, women were not allowed to join them. So a lot of men lived alone. Uh, some men, you know, had illicit relationships with other women in town, although if they were found even looking at a white woman, they were thrown in jail. Uh, but at the time, uh, the resilience came at this huge cost of giving up families. We are building a South Asian Canadian archive and some of the family stories of husbands not going back for 17 to 20 years of never having seen their families and the emotional toll it took on women back home and their children. So migration was fraught with these, uh, with these fears of uh, isolation, these fears of um, never seeing their loved ones again, these fears that the men would find other women and never come back for their children and wives. And at the same time, the wives that got left behind became chattels of the in-laws uh, uh, system, the extended family system, because they had no protection of the male. You know, the men were not there to protect them through the family challenges or financial hardships. Uh, so migration created these, you know, push and pull factors that really uh, forced people to uh, maybe uh, um, continue to live here and some of them to go back. There are lots of stories we hear now of uh, uh, husbands going back uh, and 
bringing their wives, but then finding that it's much too difficult uh, to live here without other women in the community. This is after 1921, when the right was given to women to come to Canada, and they would send their wives and children back. And so young men at 19 and 20 would then come and meet a father they had never seen before. Uh, and we take that lightly today, but I want you to put your attention to the emotional, uh, psychological damage that was done through these racist laws. And I'm really happy to see Marianne looking at the uh, migration through the frameworks of legislated uh, of laws that were so racist. Even the Continuous Journey Act, without naming the race, they created a racist law, and they never said you know, it's against this community, but what a unique way for some lawyer to have figured out a way to create a law that said, unless you come on a continuous journey, you know, you can't uh, enter the country. And the Komagatamaru story is based on that. And the idea that $200 versus 25 for a European immigrant, you know, shows the discrepancy uh, uh, against uh, uh, the communities that were coming in. And also the idea that uh, these people could live on lower wages, could live in squalid conditions, could be the vote could be taken away. The citizenship, the second class citizenship of these people needs to be uh, studied and addressed. Uh, and it would take 40 years of a struggle of you know, a handful of men, not that many, maybe 2,500 people rallying all the time. And I also want to say that we haven't done enough work on understanding the, the solidarities that might have been built between Japanese and Chinese and South Asian populations at the time, but they were also kept divided and kept separate so that they could divide and conquer and not let these communities come together around common causes. Paldi is a small town in Duncan, it, near Duncan. It's the only city in Canada that has a name of a village from India. The, there's a Paldi village in India and Husharpur. And that man who built that little village and created a sawmill, you know, that's about the only community that we can, can you imagine only one community that we can go to and unearth the stories and the archives and the images and the maps of that community to show how Japanese, Chinese, indigenous, white Europeans, settlers could all live in one community together and have some common goods. So there was a school, there was a, a general store, but as we read that history and, you know, the, the more and more we're finding that South Asian mill owners built the mills so that they could get away from the racism and discrimination in the mills. But they and they built them mostly for their, their, as a business practice, but they also followed some of those white European rules of not paying enough money to their workers and kept them in not so good condition. So we need to address the truth as we face it and question you know, what was going on within the communities. There was lots of stories about uh, South Asian men being called the boss, and so again, dividing and conquering because the South Asian man that was the boss got the flack for you know, telling someone they couldn't come to work or giving them less money. And again, the white European uh, owner of the mill you know, protected themselves from the violence or the anger that the South Asian community was feeling. But I wanna say that the activism that they felt at the time was tempered uh, with this sense of obligation and I don't think there's enough written about this idea that they were they they were so obligated to the country that they faced this racism and continued to live here. A lot of people will say, why didn't they go back? Uh, and you know, at the time, it wasn't an option for a lot of them. Uh, so uh, the stories are rich and replete with uh, real um, struggles, but also with real triumphs against so much oppression and so much injustice at the time. Um, uh, uh, the big st one of the stories we heard was that Mayo Singh, who built Paldi, you know, went to the PNE when um, the PNE grounds were used as internment camps to get the Japanese up into the interior as a holding place. And all the Japanese workers from his mill were taken to the PNE grounds. And uh, we hear that he traveled on his own expense from from Paldi near Duncan all the way to Vancouver and pleaded with the officials at the time to give his workers back to him that he would for the duration of the war, you know, look after them and take care of them and pay them and, and they would be his responsibility and he had assets that they, the government could take away and they were having none of it. Uh, you know, they rounded up the Japanese. So he kept their assets until they came back and gave it back to them at the time. 
So I want to leave you with hopeful stories. I want you to uh, look at migration, not just as a, a very negative space at the time, but that through that, uh, those experiences came up this, uh, you know, personal valor and uh, personal fortitude to fight against these kind of discriminations. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, presentation, uh, Sathvinder and Maryam. There's so much to talk about uh, we yes. do have, uh, for some discussion. So I wanted to actually just, uh, as everybody's collecting their thoughts and uh, possibly uh, offering a question or a comment, I wanted to uh, make a comment that will be posed as a question for both of you, and as I think there's a link between both the presentations, and that is how uh, the role of women transformed in the 20th century, uh, from the early 20th century as a site of exception to some degree, uh, from the mid 20th century onward. Whereas, uh, as Sutherland, as you very nicely put, the, the labor histories of Canada and the histories of migration are quite connected within the site of South Asian presence. And the role of, of women in that, we in this class have studied a bit in earlier uh, weeks on the histories of migrations in, uh, in Britain and where the labor histories and the histories of, uh, of female migrants as well as the role of women are very, very prominent. And I'm wondering if, um, if both of you could comment a bit on this longer term histories of the role of, of women within South Asian presence in Canada, uh, at some level going from, as you mentioned, South Windsor in 1921, the legal um, structures change and there's a greater uh, presence of women in different forms. Um, I'm wondering if both of you could speak about that longer term role of women within the, the South Asian histories of presence in Canada. Uh, could I start, Marianne? Um, 1921 is 100 years ago last year. So 100 years ago, the first South Asian child was born. It was born in Vancouver, and then they slowly moved to Paldi, and then they lived in Duncan. We recently uh, just met his family, and that is Marianne. That is uh, Kartarkor's grandson. So her her fam and her her son, her Dal Singh, was the first man born in Canada. So and Kartarkor left and went back to India. Her husband, unfortunately, was executed, and uh, she never came back. And her Dal Singh was brought back, and he was 16 years old by an uncle. And he never saw his mother again. And uh, he settled in Canada. And I asked his grandson and son, uh, you know, did he talk about his history? And he said, no, he was just silent. So the pain uh, uh, of women, I think Nilesh, has not been really addressed. Uh, the pain of separation over and over again has not been addressed. But I do think uh, women, once they got here and had children and created homesteads between, with their families, sometimes in multiple families living in one home, uh, there, there are really great accounts of that time. Uh, and over time, as they came out into the public sphere, the, the photos of women from the early 1900s show them wearing dresses, showing their ankles a little bit up their leg, and always wearing a headscarf, a chunni. Uh, you never see them without the chunni, but they have accepted that they needed to wear dresses. And I asked my aunt who came in 1931 how difficult that was. And she says, it was really difficult to do. But in the public sphere, women had to be seen to be adjusting to European settler life, lifestyles. And it wasn't until the 50s and 60s that the first young women were born. And then those young women, as they went through school and through higher education, you know, it wouldn't be till the 70s and 80s that you saw them in professional fields. And then in labor activism, the first woman we come across is really in the 70s and 80s uh, with, the, with the Canadian Farm Workers Union, Pritam Kaur Johal. And uh, you do see women, though, uh, in the Gurdwaras taking a big role in uh, managing the kitchen and managing the affairs of the Gurdwara, the weddings, the, the births and deaths, you do see them. And the and like Bal Balwan Singh's um, uh, Karsar Kaur being Granthis in the Gurdwara, being the so-called priests, the women played an active role inside the Gurdwara. So I want to give them lots of agency and I want to give them you know, credit for having uh, fought their way through from nothing to becoming where we are today. And so we stand on their shoulders, absolutely. They were giants and uh, we want to spend more and more time uh, looking at the stories of women because history is written by men about men usually. <laughs>
Um, yeah, that I, I think that's such a fantastic answer. I, I think it's also just a great question and it's like a subject that I want to know more about. And uh, yeah, I think like in, in my work, I think about, you know, how does the legal archive make uh, ideas about race and construct race, like knowledge about Asian women. Um, so um, yeah, so I think like I, I would definitely love to know more about women's role in um, in the labor uh, outside of the home um, and outside of the constructions made by state actors. But at this point, it's I yeah, it's just for me, it's a question that I need to pursue. Uh, could I just announce something, Neelish? Y yes, please. So and I just put it in the um, text in the chat as well. Unions in Dabad is a book that we are publishing that comes out on April 12th. We hope it's in your library and everywhere else. And uh, it's an amazing collection of uh, South Asian activism from uh, the first arrivals in 1903 uh, till the current time. And it's the first time in Canada that a book has been written about uh, activism in the unions by, by, about South Asians by South Asians. And it's going to be an online exhibit as well. So everybody will have access to the EPUB. And the, if you want a hard copy of the book, you can get a hold of me. I'll certainly be happy to give one to you. Uh, we're publishing books for all the unions and all the groups out there that want to have access to it. But it's, the, it's absolutely gives you goosebumps because a lot of women are present in that book. And so anyone who wants to further study uh, women's histories uh, can go in. The SFU has a great collection. Uh, but it's mostly men talking about uh, union leadership. Great, thank you. We're, we're all looking forward to that. That's going to be a major um, distinction once that emerges in terms of the, the field and what we can do uh, yeah. moving forward. Um, now, uh, I would like to take uh, questions in order. The first question, I believe, was from Yishong and then Puja, who has her hand up. So first, uh, Yishong and then Puja. Uh, thank you for you uh, both of you. That's a very, very uh, wonderful uh, speech. Uh, first of all, I would say, uh, as for many people, they believe that when we talk about Chinese migration, we talk about Chinese migration. When we talk about Indian migration, we talk about Indian migration, and uh, they they suppose that they are there were no connection and relationship between those two. And there were no uh, connection and uh, uh, relations between other non-white migration and other non-white. Mm. But that's so wrong. In fact. So wrong, yeah. Yeah, that's so wrong. And I think uh, both of your speech kind of uh, uh, prove that how wrong this uh, idea is. And it's also very important for not only history research, but our uh, contemporary world, because we have so many issues, so many problems among non-white people and non-white people. It's not, I would say, and it's not only in a positive way. It's not only mm -hmm. say we should unite it together or not, we should face the fact that some, mm -hmm. as a Chinese, I would say, as a Chinese, I would say uh, some Chinese are racist. Some Chinese are mm -hmm. against other minorities. We, we need to face this problem. And mm -hmm. we also need to, uh, we can think it in a positive way that we also need to focus on the uh, inter-minority kind of solidarity or cooperation. Uh, so, okay, so my question would be, so uh, as you uh, said, uh, in the early, uh, in the early 20th century, basically Chinese, Japanese, Indian migrants in the in Canada, they 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 were under the situation of divide and rule, mm. right? But my question would be: uh, were were there some kind of cooperation or kind of uh, relations between those uh, Chinese and Indian migrants and other non-white uh, migrants? Um, for example, um, as long as uh, I know that many uh, Indian migrants, they uh, came to Hong Kong, then moved to, <laughs> moved to the, moved to, so, so, so when they were in Hong Kong, did they kind of do something with Chinese? 
kind of Chinese people help them or not? Because as long as, long as I know, there were many agent in, agents in Hong Kong mm -hmm. that they, uh, they made, made fake passport, fake mm -hmm. documents mm -hmm. for Chinese migrants mm -hmm. uh, in order to help those uh, Chinese migrants to uh, illegally migrate to the US and Canada. So were uh, Indian migrants uh, also be able to uh, take advantage, advantage uh, from those agents or they have their own Indian agents in Hong Kong or something like that? Um, uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. I know that uh, uh, Kishong in the first uh, migrations came from Hong Kong and Shanghai. And the first Gurdwara that was established in the colonies was in Hong Kong. And it's still standing and I visited a few years ago and it has, you know, the, it tells a lot of history. They could do more, but for now that's the history they've portrayed. I found that uh, from what little bit that I know uh, that the crossover wasn't very good. Like they were quite isolated. Uh, they, they did their own thing. There was no real solidarities built with the Chinese communities of people who were also migrating at the time. In fact, where I questioned this was in the Komagatama route. The Komagatama route took 376 passengers on board from Hong Kong and then went to Yokohama. And they had a Japanese crew because it was a Japanese ship he had chartered. But there was no other community on that ship. No, they did not sell tickets to anyone else because there must have been hundreds of people in Shanghai and in Hong Kong also migrating. But this was a ship uh, specifically for uh, South Asians, by South Asians, for South Asians. So I feel like, I don't know enough, but I, I feel like the solidarities weren't across. And, and then we find here in Canada, we didn't get those solidarities across. Uh, this year in May, we are actually a panel of people are gonna be talking about those solidarities and how we need to, we need to build them now if they didn't happen then. Nilesh may know more with the uh, project that's going on at uh, UB, uh, UVic. Nilesh with John Price and others around the island, Vancouver Island, and the Asian communities that lived on the island. Uh, Paldi is about the only place that I can give you as an example where everybody lived together and worked together and had common causes. But it's not a common story across Canada that I know of. Marianne may have more knowledge. No, I've just come across the like, fragments here and there, um, but I don't know of any sort of coherent narrative. Like, for example, in some of the um, English language Japanese Canadian newspapers, like they follow, um, like agitating to get the vote as it's happening in um, other communities, in the Chinese and South Asian communities. Um, I've also seen um, a write up about a uh, a black man in Ontario who would help smuggle Chinese um, uh, across the river into Detroit. Um, and so that's interesting because that's the locate, right? Like that's the area with the Underground Railroad. And it'd be interesting to think about whether those networks were also used then for other um, border crossings. And then I think I, uh, through the Global South Colloquium, I remember hearing a speaker talk about. Um, about uh, about Japan and like radical education, like some South Asian leaders being going to Japan and organizing. And anyway, so <laughs> just just some like nuggets here and there that I've come across, but haven't thought about in an organized fashion. Hey, thank you for that. I'd like to make sure that we can get Pooja into the conversation. I believe she had her hand up. Your volume. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Now we. Okay. Can. Okay. I'm sorry about uh, about that, but I was just saying thank you to you, Nilesh, for organizing this and and the whole series. I've attended quite a few and thank you also to Marianne and Satsvinder for this fascinating presentation. Uh, Yushuang actually picked up on what I was going to say originally, which was about these connections. And of course, I know Marianne's work because of 
being her doctoral supervisor. Uh, but it's it's like I didn't know how well uh, the two uh, presentations were going to go together, Sathbinder. So uh, obviously, Sathbinder, your work, uh, John McLaren and I have just finished writing a paper on the legal experience of the passengers on Komagatamaru, and we've obviously drawn on your uh, on the uh, on the work that you've compiled. Um, I was actually going to ask you. Um, but before that, I'm just going to quickly ask you, is there a book launch for the unions in the bar? Yes, there is. Okay. If you want to come to the launch, it's by, by invitation only. It's on April 12th. Is it can, online? Uh, no, it's in is person. It? Finally, we can be in person. <laughs> but is it <laughs> in Victoria? Because I'm it, based in Victoria. No, no, it's in Vancouver, okay. in Surrey, actually. And oh, uh, but we oh, will, okay. but we will, yeah. we will launch uh, unions in the bat at a different time as well in different audiences. This is okay. the big launch, um, but there will be other launches. So yes, oh. I'll add you to my list. Please do, please do. And I was gonna. My other question was actually about um, now. Now that you've kind of responded to the connections piece. Uh, already to Jitwan's question. Um, my other um, question was, you mentioned kind of creating the archive. So I was wondering, have you also been involved with the SFU, Komagata yes. Maru archive? Because it's an amazing, like there's the interviews on yes. there, which also kind of reminded me, I've listened to almost all of them now, the ones that Hari Sharma had recorded. And there's a lot about women uh, in some of those interviews as well, like their lives. There's also little bits about this um, kind of how people were living together piece that you mentioned. I think a, a few people talk about kind of hanging out with Japanese kids as kids and things like that, uh, Japanese Canadian kids. So there's certainly that, but it isn't. So if you've been involved in that, I just wanted to say thank you. That's an amazing archive. That's like, we found it very, very useful for a lot of work uh, that yeah. we've done. The, there's a new archive we're developing called SACTA, the South Asian Canadian Digital Archive. I should have read digital and I missed that. And the uh, Komagata Maru SFU website is now going to be included in the SACTA website. They've just given it over to us. They don't want to manage it anymore. They've got other projects and it's starting to show some wear and tear over 15 years. So we have refurbished it. And SACTA.ca uh, now has the new new version, 2.0 version of the Komagata Maru journey. And if people want to go and have a look at it, we hope to build it. We've just taken it a uh, lock, stock and barrel, but we will uh, build it more because more knowledge and new knowledge and new information keeps coming forward. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful site, but it's been refurbished. And I think you'll, you'll enjoy the new version. Thank you. That's great. And I'll just quickly add in terms of kind of the, um, the, your question about why there weren't any uh, any passengers other than Punjabis on the mm -hmm. Komagata Maru, part of it, and obviously Rini Samavani has yes. a, you know, a lot, a lot about that. Uh, part of it was kind of the goal being to challenge yeah, these the particular orders in council, which applied only to immigrants from India. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was part of the rationale. Uh, I think I, I have also come across some references to in terms of what was happening in Hong Kong, that uh, part of the motivation or the interest in moving to Canada was also coming from Chinese uh, uh, immigrants returning from Canada, yeah. back, going back to uh, some of those colonies and, and then talking about the opportunities here, which mm -hmm. kind of led to some interest in Punjabis mm -hmm. located who were serving as policemen and other kind of uh, people in Hong Kong and other colonies there. Uh, so there are those kinds of conversations, but I completely agree. Um, and I'm excited to hear that Nilesh is involved in a project, uh, perhaps on that, that the, these are histories that I think absolutely uh, need to be written. Thank you for that. I just wanted to take the chance, since we have the opportunity, to ask uh, if uh, Marianne might uh, expand just briefly on just through the experience of the Komagata Maru we have studied here in this course that uh, there's a much larger context than only that of BC or only that of Canada uh, in the making of that event. And I was wondering if you, Marianne, could speak a bit about how the role of women and the migration of women was an issue not only of concern to Canada, but really throughout the British Empire 
South Africa is another major site where that is uh, of great importance. And whether or not uh, the policies and the debates in Canada about the migration of women took from these other parts of the British Empire and how, how that played out over time. Oh, um, that's a really like wonderful question. I mean, yeah, there's definitely different sites of um, uh, overlap with other, uh, like for example, the other dominions or self-governing um, British colonies sort of that were going to become the dominion typology. Um, so for example, there were head taxes. I understand that there was a head tax in for, for Chinese migrants in, South Africa and also Australia. Um, there was also head taxes um, on um, African Americans uh, in the United States, but they were serving different purposes. Um, so it's interesting. It was as a device. It it traveled, um, and then it was put to different uses in different contexts uh, with obviously different, yeah, different peoples. Um, I, I, think, I think that's all I want to uh, say at this point. Yeah, I, it's a huge question and it's a fantastic one. Um, and I'll, but I'll just, yeah, that's all I'll say. Great. Thank oh, you. Oh, yes, the yes. Natal formula. Yeah. Yeah. So British Columbia adopted, uh, yeah, South Africa's language test also. Yes, and so we are now, I think, unless there are any other questions or comments anywhere, any questions or comments from those here uh, in the class, if, they're not, if there's nothing else, uh, I think uh, we shall now thank our speakers, Marianne and Seth Winder, for such a wonderful set of presentations.